It's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how late she was going to work today. Okay, well, we'll just, um, maybe we'll just go ahead and uh, say hello and get started. And if folks trickle in, we'll, um, we'll just, uh, um, yeah, keep going. Um, so yeah, welcome to, and thanks, thanks for making time for this uh, little demo of the uh, Avian Knowledge Network. Um, we're really excited that we've been uh, collecting data for the uh, Oregon, in Eastern Oregon for the IMBCR program um, as part of um, our monitoring efforts for, for Klamath Bird Observatory. So, um, so there's a, yeah, a couple of different tools we'd like to show you, um, but I think first John is gonna give a little bit of an overall introduction to uh, the Avian Knowledge Network and kind of how it's set up and uh, we'll take it from there. Hey, well, thank you all for coming. And um, we're, we are really interested and we'll send an email after this and your feedback about some of the kind of stuff we put uh, that we present here that's of interest to you because this is, um, we're doing this specifically as a part of our work with Oregon, the Oregon office, but we're also gearing up for a national avian knowledge network training focused on the BLM and other federal agencies. So this is a good opportunity to look at what we think are some specific needs, what we've talked to Glenn and, and Kelly about for you all, but then think also bigger picture about how can we best engage BLM and the Avian Knowledge Network. Um, so thank you for being here. Everybody can hear me okay? Um, great. So real quick outline. I'm just going to uh, run through very quickly the Avian Knowledge Network's vision and mission. Uh, tell you a little bit about the data schema and nodes and cloud technologies, which will kind of help you understand why our data are moving the way they move through the Avian Knowledge Network. I want to talk a little bit about our node, the Avian Knowledge Northwest node that we're all partners in, um, BLM and, and KBO and Point Blue and many others, um, and some of the resources that you can find there. Um, to show an example of how by using the Avian Knowledge Network, we're able to bring data together and do custom analysis that are relevant to our various uh, partners, specifically the BLM and a sagebrush bird example, show you a couple tools that are readily available to you guys for using in NEPA analysis and other things like that, and then get into the data discovery how you can look at the data we're collecting specifically as a part of this program, download it, analyze it, and then how you can also use the IMBCR tools that are being developed that are part of our deliverables as a part of this IMBCR monitoring from the Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center. So that's kind of our outline. Um, and the Avian Knowledge Network um, is, uh, oh, I usually have my notes on this, but I'm only looking at one screen. So now I have to memorize our vision. What we're really looking at is how can avian knowledge and a network of technologies, people, and data help us use science that crosses boundaries, crosses scales, can be scaled up and scaled down to vision a future of stable and increasing bird populations through sustainable natural resource management. That's what the Avian Knowledge Network is all about, the people, the data, and the technologies coming together into this vision. And the people include citizen scientists contributing to eBird, biologists, the programmers at Point Blue, our programmers who are helping us develop tools, researchers who are using the data, the land managers who are using the data, conservation practitioners, anyone who can get involved, use the data, lend the data to the Avian Knowledge Network, um, help develop the technologies to deliver the science in meaningful and relevant ways so we can do better things for birds. We are only as strong as our partners, um, and there are many of them. There's no way to create a slide with all of those. This is uh, some of the partners that we're leading in the Federal Avian Data Center or the National Node Project. Um, and so that's really the strength. The other strength is that we run on a, um, a model of government, non-government organizational cooperative agreements and fundraising through private fundraising and federal fundraising, which makes our databases so far a bit stable, more stable than some of the federal databases that we've actually seen crumble and go away. And the Avian Knowledge Network has actually been able to scoop up and save like the Point Count database, like the Secret of Marshburg database. Currently we're working with the Forest Service to um, 
uh, save a bunch of data databases that are going away as their contract with the enterprise group goes away. Um, and so it's about the data. And it's about a concept that we came up with a long time ago, no data left behind. Um, many different protocols. We really all count birds in different ways, but there's common denominators behind the way we count birds. And we try to think about those common denominators and bring data together so we can scale up and com com combine data into common schemas, provide security, backup. Um, we're working on FedRAMP certification to make sure we're following um, some of the guidelines that are required by many of our federal partners focused not only on observations of birds, but weather data and other data about the site or the sampling unit where you collected birds and what was happening there on that day, that year, um, and any given time. And then there's the technologies that we use to preserve the data, allow the data to be discoverable. Um, we're gonna show you some of this. How can you summarize the data that, that are in there? And then how you, can we get the data into, into your planning, into your reports, um, into your hands so they can be used to make a decision, to make a difference in the decision-making that we uh, make for, um, for, uh, for, for birds and for natural resource management. So the architecture involves the data owner over here in the right-hand corner who interacts with the data management, the project leader aspects of the database and the data system. We're not gonna focus much on that because in this scenario, KBO is doing the data management, but we wanna make sure you guys have access to the data through the tools. So the data owner, and you guys are co-owners of the data with us, of course, um, gets the data in, uses the tools to enter them, make sure they're secure, make sure that they're correct, so do the QA, QC, and then push them down into what are called warehouses, which are places that data can then be made available to the public based on the data owner and the data partner's very specific recommend, uh, requirements. Some data owners don't want their data to be seen at all. Some data owners want their data to be freely available to anybody, anytime. And there's lots of opportunities in between. From the warehouses, there's internal password protected tools that you can use to look at different data sets and analyze different data sets. And we're gonna show you those. They kind of come back to the data owner and their partners. That's all of us in this meeting together and how we can interact with the data and how you can get the data into your hands. But then there's also sets of tools in the warehouses that allow for broader scaled up analyses that you and others can use the data if they're made available through these various data security um, filters. And so these, this is kind of the basic data schema. We have data sharing levels, as I mentioned, we enter the data, the observations, they're raw, we make sure they're clean, and then we make them available to very, either very restricted, you can't see them all, or to their shared openly. Most KBO data are available shared with permission, which means they can be seen, um, they can be discovered, but to get the pure raw data, we ask that people um, ask for permission, usually sign data sharing agreements. So some of the data sharing tools that we're gonna show you will provide will be require passwords that when you want the data at that level, we'll give them to you. We can also hide sites if we want to, if they're sensitive sites, like they're on private lands, or we can hide um, if I get a rare or endangered species on an event, on a survey, I can hide that entire survey if need be, if we don't want data to be visible for certain species or for certain places and things like that. So one of the confusing things about the Avian Knowledge Network that we're going to hopefully demystify is the node concept. The node is simply a window or a view into the Avian Knowledge Network. Um, and a way to access tools and get information out of the Avian Knowledge Network. And so the nodes in many cases are audience specific, whether it be audiences that are interested in secretive marsh birds or colonial birds, or whether it be the Pacific Flyway Shorebird Survey node, or whether they're regional nodes. So the Avian Knowledge Northwest node that we run is, is very regional in nature. And we try, try to provide information that's relevant to uh, people who can do good things for birds in the Pacific Northwest. The um, Federal Avian Data Center, another example of a node, um, really came out of funding that came from the Council for Migratory Birds. Um, and uh, really a lot of what we're gonna show you was built through capacities from the Federal Avian Data Center funding from many different land management agencies, including the BLM, a huge investor in the Federal Avian Data Center. Another offshoot of that was the Borderlands node. But today we're gonna to focus mostly on Avian Knowledge Northwest, 
We're going to show you tools that were made available to us through the Federal Avian Data Center. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center that is the home of IMBCR. So some of the IMBCR specific tools are available there. So data centers work on data and tools that are uh, made available through cloud services. Most of the data centers work off of the Point Blue, formerly Point Reyes Bird Observatory Conservation Science Cloud, um, the Federal Avian Data Center, the Borderlands Node, and the Avian Knowledge Northwest Nodes. However, there are other avian knowledge network clouds, including Bird Conservancy of the Rockies clouds. These talk to each other, and we can talk amongst nodes and clouds as well. So for example, Avian Knowledge Northwest, the Klamath Bird Observatory enters our IMBC data, MB, IMBCR data into Avian Knowledge Northwest. So it goes into the science cloud. We'll show you why we do that. We've got 25 years of data, millions of records of data that we've collected in collaboration with the BLM and the Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest. And we wanted to keep those data whole for the analysis tool that Kate's gonna show you. But then we push those data from the Point Blue Cloud into the Bird Conservancy Cloud. So those data can also interface with the IMBCR data tools and the Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center. So nodes simply windows into the data and the data systems and clouds are different secured places where data are stored and communicated amongst each other. So the Avian Knowledge Northwest, you can see we've got a lot of data. These blue data are all data we've collected in, in collaboration with our partners here in the klamath siskiyou bio region, combined with Point Reyes Bird Observatory data, data that were collected as far as some Forest Service and other university efforts, all available. We have an eBird uh, node or portal that we do concert, uh, community science through, and lots of very specific tools um, for uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, so some of those tools are, and here's where we're going to get wild today, we're all going live on the Avian Knowledge Network. Here are some tools that are available on Avian Knowledge Northwest that we thought that you would be interested in. So if you go to Avian Knowledge Northwest, you can go to both resources and decision support tools. You can see the partners in flight bird conservation plans are stored there. Some of these are being revised with support from the, from the BLM right now. There's different management guides that are available there that are specific for addressing oak woodland habitat restoration and management and things like that available on Avian Knowledge Northwest. And we've got some really fun science summaries that we find very useful and very influential um, in working with our managers in the adaptive management scenario. A, a, a really neat one that Caitlin helped us put together about science and adaptive management in the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. It's about a 15 year story about management decisions that were data driven. Another um, really uh, effective one is um, the Oak Woodland and Chaparral tool that's helping the Medford BLM do a lot of their management in Oak Woodlands and making sure they're not doing things that are detrimental to birds that we're worried about that are dependent on, um, on uh, uh, chaparral habitats. Um, and then, so, so there, th those are some of the kinds of tools uh, that are available through Avian Knowledge Northwest. Um, so one of the things I did want to show you is when we get all of the data in, we can start to use the science that we do to provide tools. These are some papers that we wrote that Kate Halstead um, was a lead on, and, and one of the papers was uh, her um, thesis uh, chapter um, that was just awarded the best landscape scape ecology paper in 2020, is about to be awarded that later this month. And we looked at shrub step and grassland species combine data from all of these different data sources in the Northern Basin and Range region crossing five different states, brought those data together through these avian knowledge network technology and created distribution models for 21 species across that region and use those to analyze what birds do we think will be protected well under the pack sage grouse conservation strategy, which I'm not really quite sure is in place or not, but if it was or if it wasn't. And we could see that birds that fall to the right of the right line are protected well by packs, but birds like the sage brush sparrow, we might need to do more than just protect important lek areas for sage grouse to take care of some of these other sage brush birds. These are the kind of custom analyses that come out of our partnerships of getting data into the avian knowledge network. Um, I promised I was gonna be on rapid mode and I am, there's a couple other tools I wanted to show you also that are available in Avian Knowledge Northwest. Um, so we're gonna go back to the live version. 
The phonology tool is a really exciting tool where you can go to this interactive mapping tool. You can find an area that you're interested in and you can select the area of interest using this selection tool. Let's just take this, um, this area out here in far Eastern Oregon, or at least far for us, and then ask it to create a graph. And what it does is it takes this area and gives you a downloadable species report, which gives you a histogram that shows you the, the predicted abundance, the, the predicted probability of occurrence 52 weeks a year throughout the year. So you can look at, and you can see there's not a lot of data out in those areas. So one of the things you can do is look at where do we need to go collect more data, but then you can also see um, different species that you might be concerned about and get an idea of their occurrence throughout the year in your planning area. Um, so that's the histogram tool. Uh, this little thing is getting in my way. Um, the other tool I wanted to show you all was the um, climate vulnerability tool for Oregon and Washington. Um, again, we can take a look at uh, the um, different areas of Oregon and Washington and we can ask for, this is an example for the sagebrush sparrow. What's the current distribution of sagebrush sparrow? Okay, what? Is, do we predict that's going to happen with the sagebrush sparrow into the future? It looks like it's, it's going to be reduced in its occurrence across the landscape. And then I can see that this watershed here is going to be a really important stronghold for sagebrush sparrows into the future. And then I can actually download a report for that watershed that tells me about the current and predicted future abundance of all the sagebrush species in that area. And then don't try to read this gives you all of the data about habitats and other kind of things predicted into the future for you to use in your um, ecosystem management planning if you're going to be planning in um, and considering climate change as a part of the decision making that you're doing. Um, there's data exploration tools like the multi map that I showed you here before where you can actually explore map, explore and map data. And then you can look at the catalog. And I just wanted to show you that the catalog actually gives you um, a list of all of the different data sets in Avian Knowledge Network and in Avian Knowledge Northwest. You can come in and you can see that, that we, Avian Knowledge Northwest and the Point Blue Science Cloud is holding two important IMBCR data sets. The one that the Great Basin Bird Observatory is using and the one that the KBO is collecting. And now I'm gonna hand things over to Kate when you discover that these data are there, when you get the passwords to use those data, Kate's gonna show you how you can start to actually use and play with those data. We might have a minute for some questions. I know there was a lot there. So um, maybe if there's any burning questions right now while Kate's getting ready to go. With that, I'm gonna mute myself because there's a little bit of construction going on. Go for it, Kate. Hi guys, I'm Kate Halstead. For those of you that I haven't uh, met yet, I'm a research biologist at KBO and helping with the Avian Knowledge Network project in general with um, data management and training. So I'm just going to, as John said, show you a couple of the tools that are available through Avian Knowledge Network. And I'm gonna do that by looking at the Avian Knowledge Northwest node. So I'm gonna share my screen. And I will just show you um, how we get in there. Yeah, this little, there we go. The uh, zoom bar at the top is kind of in my way. But um, so this is the Avian Knowledge Northwest homepage. Um, to get into the tools that we're going to be looking at, we're going to go to data management. And the first one we're going to look at is the downloader tool. And that is going to help you uh, download entire data sets for any project that is set to the sharing level that is necessary to get the entire data set. Um, in this case, we'll be looking at the IMBCR data set. So we'll click on access and download. Click on the data downloader button. Wait for it to load. And the easiest way to specifically get into the IMBCR data set is to scroll all the way down. You'll see that there are a number of different filters that you can set different criteria that you might be interested in. 
um, including protocols, dates, species, regions, and all the way at the bottom here, projects. So these are all as a default set to all projects, but we're going to go to specific project and scroll down until um, I happen to know that the technical name for the IMBCR project uh, that we're looking at today is KBO IMBCR. So it's this one right here. So I click on that. And then scroll, do I scroll? Sorry, I lost myself, there we go. <laughs> and then hit the search button. And that will search through our entire uh, data catalog to find any data sets using this project name. So you'll see here at the bottom that we have, um, let me just hide my thumbnail here. Um, we have two years of data under that project name. It will show you the number of locations, number of birds, so total observations, number of species by year. And then there will be this little button here that says download, it will give you some other um, important information about that download. So you just hit the download button, bam, there it is. Click on it, opens up a CSV file, and there is the data set, the full thing coming straight out of the AKN. So this is a pretty big one, really quick process for getting your data. So I'm gonna close that out. And then the second thing that we're going to look at is the called the analyst tool in the ACAN. Again, we can access this through the Avian Knowledge Northwest node. You can also um, access it straight through the Avian Knowledge Network website. Personally, I find it a little bit easier to navigate starting from uh, Avian Knowledge Northwest anyway. So it's convenient that we're talking about that anyway today. Uh, so I would suggest starting from here if you want to look at the analyst. So again, hovering over data management, going to explore and analyze. We have some options here. John was showing you the interactive maps and the phonology tool. We're going to go to the analyst tool, which is the button here. I'm going to log in using my username and password. And then um, I get to decide which data type I'd like to analyze. Right now we're going to look at point counts. And then again, you are given a list of the different projects that are um, available. And I'm again going to select KBO IMBCR and hit next. And then this page just shows you all of the different op or, uh, options for criteria you can use to filter what you want the analyst to do for you. And so this is a great way to actually uh, create outputs of, of analysis for your data without even having to download the data in the first place. Everything is packaged for you, no need to write codes or scripts or do anything outside of this program. Um, all you have to do is know in advance which transects you, which projects and then transects you would like to look at. Um, and in one of the cases of this tool, which species you may wanna look at. So just for the purposes of the example, I'm going to go over here to this tree of all, these are all the different transects that are available within KBO IMBCR. And I'm going to select a few that I want to examine. Um, actually, before I do that, let's start with just uh, kind of the most basic tool here. We have like th really three main summary types um, or analysis types. This is just the summary information. All I'm going to do is select all of the transects and let that run. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Sometimes the connection gets slow and there it is. So it pops up in the same tab. At the top here, we'll just show you all of the different transects, all of the different points. And then as you scroll, scroll down under this results bar here, these are all of the different um, 
options that you can click on to look at different ways of summarizing these data. So if you want to do something like an effort report, you want to see how many visits you, uh, you have for all of your transects by year, you can do that. By month, you can do that. Observations by month and year. So say you wanna, this is what you're going after. For all of these, all you have to do is click on that um, title. And um, for KBO IMBCR, this isn't uh, very exciting because there's only a couple of years of data um, and a couple of months of data, but this is your observation table. This is your table of observations by month and year. Then again, um, you can either scroll all the way back up, find that list again, or you can just scroll through the page and just see what the different options are. Some of these tables are very big, so I do find it handy to refer to this results um, uh, list in order to find what I'm looking for. So let's look at another one. How about total observations of each species by year? I'll click on that one. And this is a little bit more exciting because it will actually show you all of the various species that were detected in this entire project by year. So in 2019 and then in 2020. Um, this is great, but then if you want to put this in some kind of report or, ex or export it for additional analyses just based on this particular uh, result, you can use these little links to either download it as a PDF if you just want to put it as is into a report, or if you want to actually get the data, you can click CSV. We'll do the same thing as happened before. You get a CSV file. You can open it up as a new tab in your browser. So there are some options there for how to look at it. And oh, this Zoom thing is getting in the way again. Okay, I'm gonna move that. Okay, so I went back and here's just that same summary report. Again, I'm going to go all the way back into the analyst tool and you'll see that everything kind of reset itself. So now I want to look, uh, let's look at species richness next. And I will just for this, so it doesn't take too long to load, just select transex um, BCR9 BU1 through five. Um, I'll do all months, all years, uh, distance up to 50 meters and all species. Click species richness. And similar to the last one, it will show you which transects you're looking at and what points are in that transex, transect. And again, you'll get a list of results, really same story, except you just have different results. So uh, we have a table of mean species richness. Um, essentially within uh, the, these other analyst tools you'll have, or within the various analyst tools, you'll have either tabular or graphical results, depending on what, you know, what the options you've selected are. So here we have um, a table of mean species richness for these transects <coughs> by year. And then you will see this graph um, of the, the same thing. So just presented in a different way. And as before, you can you have all of these different ways of downloading. We'll try the PDF this time. And this is a little PDF of your report. Um, yeah, trend estimates. Um, this is a simple linear trend estimate of richness. Um, yeah, this is a pretty short one. So that's, that's one option, species richness analysis. Then I will go back again to our analyst tool. I'll select the same transects, one through five and BCR nine, BU one through five. Um, and then we're gonna look at the density and abundance analysis. Now for this one, uh, because of the uh, intensiveness of the analysis of actually calculating density and abundance by species, 
the tool will only let you do 10 species at a time. So just keep that in mind. If you, uh, like I did with the other ones, just leave all of these other criteria, all these other filters at their defaults, and you hit density and abundance, you would get a, um, an error message. So just, you can always go back and fix it. If you forget about that, it's easy enough to do. Just wanted to mention it. So we'll just kind of randomly pick a few species uh, to look at. Click the density and abundance button and let it load. And you're probably getting used to how these look at this point. So same situation here. And it will list for you the species you've selected. And again, you get uh, your results. And you'll see that you have many more <laughs> results options. Um, it looks like I have some errors down here. I'm not sure exactly what that's about, but um, probably nothing to worry about. Um, it might be a, uh, yeah, we can, we can look at that if we really want to, but um, this is just sort of, again, the intensiveness of calculating all these things by species. This is why you can only do 10 at a time. So if you want to say, do all of your species, um, you would have to kind of do them in batches, but this is really great because you now have, um, this one is point level estimates of abundance birds per point from your data by listing it by scientific name and transect. Um, one thing I didn't mention before that is that these tables, you can interact with them. So if you wanna say sort it by common name, you can do that. You can sort it by scientific name, um, by year, by transect, et cetera. So these are some really great statistical analyses that again, you don't really have to do all of that much in terms of downloading your data, writing code. All you have to do is make decisions about which transects you would like to look at, which years, uh, dates, which species you want to look at, and the tool will just crank it out for you. Um, see if we can find a graph here. So this is the trend in abundance over the over year collected is basically by um, that's the name of the column for the uh, the data that is essentially the year that the data were collected. So this will show you in 2019 and 2020. These are each of the different transects, and here is your trend estimate. Um, so yeah, this it now will do this for for each of your species, uh, house finches here. So really, again, just excellent, um, excellent analyses. You can just scroll through and just see all of the, the different things. So I'm wondering, attempt to produce trend estimate failed. Yeah, I don't know that that's relevant because it looks like it did actually create trend estimates. So I'm not sure what's going on there. John and I can talk about that if he thinks it's an issue. Um, but yeah, I think that is pretty much that for uh, my piece. Um, would anyone like to ask any questions while we're looking at the analyst? I think we have a couple minutes before we need to go to Caitlin's. Hey, just as I was supposed to, I was gonna start answering questions that are being asked. On the line, online, somebody started a leaf blower, and I don't understand why. Oh, okay. Leaves here. Um, the so I've been answering some questions that have been coming online, uh, which are okay. great. One of the things I did want to mention is that um, uh, Glenn is some of the things that are going to be very relevant to what Caitlin is going to get into, which is the IMBCR specific analyses, where we're we've designed these to about densities over time for the um, frames that we're using. So BLM lands and BCR9 or BLM lands and BCR5. The analyses that Kate was just showing are more basic analyses about the locations that you select 
um, for those analyses. So while the design is sound and the analysis in these analyst toolboxes um, are legitimate to use when you wanna look at, let's say data we've collected on your um, district or in your project area, that these are good tools and good analysis tools to use. The design that Glenn is referring to becomes very specific to what the, Caitlin's gonna be looking at um, with the IMBCR. Uh, presentation that's coming. The other thing I just wanted to mention to you guys, and this is a question for all of us to ask, um, both at the Oregon level and nationally, is how do we want to manage access? Because all of these tools and these downloads are password protected. And so we're working with the DOD and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've been talking to Renee about this at a national level, is to how does the BLM want to access passwords, data ownership, the different kind of data levels, because there are places you can go with these passwords where you could accidentally um, do things to the data that you might not want to do. Now, the data are backed up regularly. So if anything did happen catastrophic, it wouldn't be catastrophic because we just go to yesterday's data set and bring it back. But that's just another question I um, posed in the chat that we're going to want to talk about into the future. Thank you, Kate. Are there any other questions? We're doing okay for time based on how much time Caitlin said that she had. And thank you for introducing yourself, Kate. I forgot to do that. My name's John Alexander. I'm the director here at KBO. Hi, I had another, I had a question. Um, I was just wondering, are there, as you're kind of going through that, I was wondering, are there certain spatial scales that would be perhaps too large or too small that are not appropriate when you are doing these very various queries? Um, that really depends on the tool. So some of these modeling tools that we're working on, we're definitely trying to make the tools so you can't go too small in the areas of inference. That would be, would be what I'd be most worried about um, is some of these modeling tools like the histogram tool um, and thinking that you're looking at data that precisely mark where somebody wants to put a communication tower versus a summary of data that really represent a much larger polygon in and around that centroid. Um, as far as point count data are concerned, these are the raw data that you're looking at. So you're looking at averages. Um, the, the sampling here is each of these, if, um, if Kate were to click the plus button on one of them, are collections of points. So in this case, yes. the smallest sampling unit is that grid of 13 or 15 points. So if you get an average of birds across that grid at any given time, that's a good number for that time and that survey. And you know, you start to wanna ask uh, questions about what's my ability to really give a good density estimate and those kind of things. These black box tools, and there are, um, there's documentation about how they work, but you've got to be very careful with these tools because you need to understand what the what they, you can use these tools on any of the data sets. So it's really the analyst's responsibility at some point not to overcook the data, let's say. Um, but I think as far as summarizing data, doing species richness summaries, looking at general trends in bird abundance um, across an area of interest, these are raw count data. Um, so it's, it's less of a concern you, what, when you're going to want to be careful of some of the things that Glenn was mentioning, what's our inference when we start to analyze all these data together and get a density estimate, we can give you a density estimate for, uh, BLM lands that were sampled in IMBCR5 in Oregon, right? And then, but we can't on Forest Service, can the Forest Service come in and use that information to make some decisions? That's up to their threshold of, of where they want to go. And hopefully they're real clear about what um, assumptions they're violating. Uh, but some data are better than no data sometimes. So um, th those are great questions, Renee. Yeah. Thank and you. just um, specific to uh, the analyst tool, if uh, for what we were looking at, um, you do have the option, as it's showing right here, I, I believe, John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this distance um, option should be sensitive to, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm That's not sure if actually it's very specific to the count data. The so I actually always go all species when I'm looking at data yeah. in the beginning all because distances. you cut off so many birds when you just start looking at. So what we've done yeah. is homogenized all point count data to birds within 50 meters, birds within 100 meters, and birds outside. Mm -hmm. 
And then, yeah. so your densities will definitely go up if you use all birds in this analysis. So this density analysis is quite different than the sophisticated density analyses that the IMBCR program is providing you guys in the reports that we give each year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, you just, uh, for this one, you just want to select what's most appropriate to your purposes. If you would like to see everything that um, has been detected, no matter the distance and the potential um, overlap between points um, or among points, that's fine. Uh, if you really just want to make sure to constrain directly to what's immediately around your point, you have that option too. Any other quick questions before you move to Caitlin? Okay, let me find my stop screen share. <laughs> I mixed everything up on my screen here, so let me just refine everything. I can stop you. Can you? Yep. Okay. okay. You're up, Caitlin. Oh, there it is. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. So I'm going to show everyone how to um, use the tools that are in the uh, Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center. Um, I'm Caitlin Gillespie, I'm also a KBO research biologist. I've communicated with many of you over email, um, but just as a quick introduction. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna show you a little bit about the IMBCR specific tools that are available. Um, so the Rocky Mountain Avian Data Center, I'm gonna just go ahead and share my screen here. Um, looks like this. Uh, so you've got a, uh, everyone, can everyone see this? Um, Rocky Mountain. Okay. Um, so this, there's a lot here that you can um, access to, but in order to access the IMBCR data, what we're going to do is you're going to, from the homepage of the Rocky Mountain Data Center, you're going to hit this explore the data button, and that'll take you to the tool. So this is, um, you're just gonna hit okay on this little disclaimer that's gonna, that's telling you how to be careful when using data, <laughs> essentially, as we all know as scientists. Um, so you'll see this map uh, here. And uh, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna filter to a location. So this is, um, the hub for for all of the data that is is um, available within the Avian Data Center. So the first thing we're going to want to do is use this little filter tool up here. So uh, in order to add a filter, there's uh, several different filters you can choose from. The first filter that you're going to want to do, if you are interested in IMBCR data, is you're going to want a study design filter. So I'm going to hit study design. I'm going to hit this button add, and this little pop up comes up, and I'm going to scroll down and hit IMBCR, and so that will restrict my query to only IMBCR data that's collected. Hit add filter. All right, so you can see up here now I've got my study design is IMBCR. Now I want to further restrict my query to Oregon. So I'm going to scroll down here to state. I'm going to hit add. And then it gives me a state filter. So I'll go down to Oregon, add this filter. And then um, you can query all species at once, but the analyses end up being very messy looking and not very readable. So um, just as a very basic example, I'm gonna show you how to query data for a specific species. Um, so I want to say I'm interested in, in brewer sparrow. So I'm gonna add a species filter. I'm gonna scroll down and find my brewer sparrow. 
There he is. And add that filter. Okay, so now I'm all set up here. I've got all of my filters ready to go. And then I'm gonna hit this little red run query button. All right, and then the map automatically zooms into the area that I've selected and you see all of the points that are available within IMBCR in Oregon um, that I've queried for. Um, these little circles uh, represent the points and if they're filled in with a little dot, you can see the on the legend here, it means that the species that I was querying for was detected there. So I can um, click this little box, it'll pop up and it'll sh show you how many detections and what date the survey was um, at that particular location. So um, you can explore around on the map if you want. There's, um, you can also switch between satellite and map if uh, it makes it easier for you to see. I kind of like satellite. Um, it's a little bit easier to see the terrain and think about the habitat a little bit. Um, and importantly, this is like, you can't zoom in very far. This is sort of, this is the publicly available um, uh, level of the data. So the points here are not exactly at the exact location. They're a little bit off center and you can't zoom in any farther than this. So that protects the privacy of any, um, of, of any specific locations that are in this data set. Um, so now that I've got my query set up, I can go up to these tabs up here and the occupancy estimates is one of the tools that uh, Rocky Mountain or Bird Conservancy of the Rockies um, does as part of the IMBCR program. They provide these occupancy estimates for us every year. Um, and you can see at the top here, if you hover over these little column headers, it'll tell you um, what it what it means. So psi is the um, is the occupancy estimate. We've got a standard error, and then a, a coefficient of variation, um, standard deviation divided by the mean. Basically, the lower it is, the the less variability, the more confident. Um, um, the occupancy estimate is for that transect. So you see here, it's 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 given to you by different strata, so um, and then and then by different years. So we've got two years of data. Um, we've got four separate strata in the Eastern Oregon IMBCR effort so far that are in uh, BCR nine, and those are broken down by district. Or you can also see the occupancy estimates for the entire BCR nine Oregon strata. Uh, BLM. Um, you've got this little graph over here that shows these um, these these different occupancy and, and standard error levels um, by color with their standard errors. And if I want to save this data and graph it in another program, um, you have these options to copy the uh, chart you see here to the clipboard or to save it as a CSV. Um, so those are the occupancy estimates. The density estimates are calculated by strata as well. Um, and so you'll see here that the table looks similar. We've got um, the strata broken, we've got these larger strata. We've also got individual, um, individual strata by district um, in BCR9. Um, and then uh, again, if you hover over here, D is density birds per square kilometer. And then uh, the estimated population size is just the density multiplied by the area. So it gives you an estimate of population size. And again, your um, uh, coefficient of variation as sort of a measure of the uh, variability um, of those estimates. Um, yeah, and then there's a nice little graph here that'll show you, um, allow you to compare um, sort of across years. This is going, you know, from 2009 to 2020 for our two years of data to show kind of how those density estimates have changed. Um, same tools are available up here. You can copy the data to the clipboard or save it to Excel. And then the final uh, little uh, tool that's here 
is a species count. So um, it defaults to an unrestricted species count, just gives you a total of the species in each year for the entire uh, BCR9 in Oregon. But if I want to, I can break this down by uh, smaller um, pieces. So I'm interested in how many per county. I can refresh this and get an estimate um, that way or get a, a total number, a total count, and then the uh, survey effort that um, contributed to that. Um, yeah, so in summary, that's that's kind of how this these tools work. Um, there's all kinds of ways to filter. If, I'm in, if I want to save this filter, um, what I can do is I can hit this little generate URL button at the top. And that'll give me a little pop-up window here and I can copy and paste this into a Word document or into an email. And um, that will uh, save this particular query that I've set up um, so that I don't have to redo those filters every single time. I can just go directly here where I've already got those filters set up or I can send it to a colleague or, or, um, or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's in summary of how this uh, this tool works. Um, I will try and uh, I don't know if there's any specific questions. Thank you, Caitlin. That was great. I, I have one quick yeah. question just to get us sure. going. Um, oh, and then I'm seeing one from Matt on there, so I will. Uh, uh, get that going. Those are uh, yeah. Are those pointer or are those grids? Do you know? These are grids. Those are grids. So, yeah. So these are the the study design is is based on one kilometer grids that have up to sixteen points. So that so whether the bird was detected there or not is determined as if it was detected on at least I guess one point on that grid during that survey time. Or yeah, so. yeah. So it's yeah at the grid level. For the transects during 2020 as compared to 2019. Okay, so this is an interesting question. How much is occupancy data affected by only doing half of the transects during the 2020 season as compared to 2019? So, um, like any calculation of density and occupancy, um, there's always a power involved. And the more ones and zeros you have together. So, if you think about occupancy modeling, what you're looking at is a grid of zeros and ones and how many places did I not count that burden and how many places did I count that burden? What you're trying to estimate is how many times did I really miss the bird? What's the probability of a bird being there even if I didn't get it? That's one of the things occupancy is getting. So um, I don't think we can say our occupancy models are half as good if we have half of the data in one year than another, uh, but it's certainly, um, these are data hungry models. Um, and so it's, that's going to be an influence uh, around our power um, and power is going to be different for every bird. Um, it's based on, uh, it, it can vary by habitat, it can vary by all sorts of different things. And so we'd really want to get into the detailed report that Bird Conservancy of the Rockies does provide. Um, and I, I haven't reviewed the one from last year and whether they got into the um, effects of COVID on their estimates or not, or the effects of COVID on our ability to sample and then the estimates or not. But that's a, that's a really good question and harder to answer um, in any more specifics than I just gave pretty vaguely. Caitlin or Kate probably could dig more into the equation um, than me. Hi, Kaylin. I had a question, um, if you don't mind going back a couple slides, <laughs> just, just right, for some ahead. clarification, just because I, um, in I don't the, uh, I'm just sharing a browser window. Is this? Oh, you are. Yeah, I'm oh, just using the yeah, yeah, right yep. here. So you were saying that on the top, you're looking more the entire state, but then um, as, as we go down that table, you're actually looking at individual field office areas? Is that what those are? They're districts. So the way we okay. stratified the IMBCR study design in Eastern Oregon was um, by 
uh, bird conservation region and by district. So we have four strata that we survey mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. part of BCR9 in Oregon. Um, and those are, so you, you can get the estimate for the whole um, survey effort in BCR9 in Oregon, BLM land um, kind of up here, but then you can also see those um, occupancy estimates broken down by district. Okay, and you were saying that the colors are representing basically the different levels of confidence we have in those density estimates. Uh, yeah, so the colors, yeah, they're just identifying how these individual rows are displayed on the on the graph and then these little, um, yeah, these little tiny um, bars here are the standard uh, standard error. So the so let's get that clear. The color is not necessarily red is better than green or blue. The color showing you where on the graph you can find that occupancy estimate and then yeah. where you can find the confidence interval and actually view the confidence interval. So you really are the 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 larger the standard error or the confidence variable, especially compared to the occupancy estimate itself, is going to be your measure of confidence. Yeah. And you can turn oh. some of these lines off too. Okay. So I was actually trying to associate green as being good and red as being bad right. and was getting yeah. confused. Okay. Yeah. BBS does that sometimes when they give you their trends, they tell you how much they like their trend or not. This is helps you identify <laughs> it on the graph. So then you can use the graph to visualize your confidence. Okay. Perfect. I Thanks for that clarification. All right. Well, we're at 2.30 um, and definitely want to be respectful of everybody's time, but we really would love your feedback. So um, I know, Caitlin, you were working with um, Glenn and, um, and Kelly, and then we uh, told Jeff and Renee to come in so they could see some of the kind of things we might think about doing in some of these broader ones. So please funnel your questions, your suggestions back to us. This was really more um, about analysis, not as much about data management, because we're handling that with this project, but um, we're really interested in how can we best present the AKN to you, and what are the scenarios that you would like, that you that we can help use the AKN to help make your job easier and better and more fun um, with birds, because birds are fun. Um, and so uh, we're really interested in your feedback and really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you all for coming. We will be, uh, well, we recorded the session, so we'll be sending out a link um, for anyone who missed uh, the presentation today. And we also are putting together kind of a, a two-pager step-by-step -step with some screenshots kind of to, to show the same things we showed today, um, just as a, an additional little tool to help you out. And if, you can always email us too. So John, you said birds are fun, and and um, dang it, what can you remember what what Charissa Morris said about something about really awesome or something to the effect a few years ago? I, I'm I, well. I, think, I was just trying to remember what the World Migratory Bird Day theme is, which is something like fly, sing, and 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 sing. do something and have fun. Yeah, outside. <laughs> Hey, yeah. thank you, KBO. Um, thank you for all your hard work and thank you districts for coordinating with them. Um, this is really awesome uh, data. Like, like you said, you know, it's only two years, but we're just getting to just imagine if we just keep this up for, for year after year, um, the legacy, you know, the night shift, what you're leaving for, for your successors, they're just gonna be so grateful. In the meantime though, I mean, where else can you get really good um, local to sort of regional district level uh, estimates for, for certain birds. I, I don't think there is an alternative out there. Maybe, maybe there is, but, and this is not to replace or, or not to say that this is all we need. Uh, we still need project level, you know, we need, we'll, we'll still need surveys and monitoring at the project level. So you're not out of work on the districts, but this is just, it's kind of a lot like AIM and the, and the, the bat monitoring and everything. I, so that's the direction everything's going now is, you know, to, to be able to scale up and across and, and look at trends 
and, and not just have a bunch of one-off, very myopically so, um, uh, focused monitoring, which has its place, but you're always gonna wanna know, I mean, what does this mean relative to the distribution of the bird, to the population? Is it doing uh, great in this one little spot in the world and, um, and poorly everywhere else? We, we don't know, but this, this is gonna help answer it. So thank you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll have to have to add last that this was part part of my frustration with with seeing aim and 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 bat surveys going forward without birds going forward too because we had this opportunity to take and I sure hope the people in the field uh, can push the the sport up through to headquarters for future years because it doesn't. It, it doesn't happen again without that kind of support from the field. Well, and I just can say, you know, uh, with 20 years of working with Oregon, a BLM, and with the Washington office, um, Jeff Walsh, your, your push for the Avian Knowledge Network and IMBCR across states, this couldn't happen without you and all of the wonderful work we've done in Partners in Flight in the Pacific Northwest over the last 20 plus years couldn't have happened without BLM leadership. So thank you all so much. Not, not to, not to, um, <laughs> now it's Renee's chance to, to see what you're doing and take and show the advantage of using it. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. I, I'm a slow learner. So I think I'm going to have to circle back around with you all on some additional questions that I have. My mind's kind of blown, blown away with all this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to go and look at some of those birds, by the way. Um, you know, I mean, I, I really need to get out there and check out your transects. <laughs> Excellent. Sounds good. All right, folks, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.